please welcome the extraordinary and lovely Eddie Redmayne. Wowza. What did you know about Stephen Hawking before you began? Embarrassingly little. Uh, I, I, um, I'd actually been at university at Cambridge um, where Stephen teaches and... And so Ooh, I had, Stephen, you call him uh, Stephen. Stephen. <laughs> now I call him Professor Hawking, Sir God, for many, many a day. But he actually he told me one of the first things he said to me was, I was calling him Professor for a good forty minutes of meeting him, and then it, the first thing he said in his voice was, "Please call me Stephen." But I couldn't work out because of the tone of his voice doesn't change. I couldn't work out whether that was like stop being so sycophantic, or whether it was like sort of please call me Stephen. Um, anyway, he. Um, but yeah, no, I knew very little. I had I studied history of art at university. I gave up science when I was a kid. Um, so all I knew was that he uh, suffered from this degenerative disease. I knew his silhouette, his, and I knew that he'd done some work into these things called black holes, which I also knew very little about. Um, so that was about it. <laughs> but it's interesting. That, well, you, when you said you knew his silhouette. You mean of work, but also physically. This may be the the most unusual man that we all know what he looks like. He's he's a famous image because of the sale of his books and because he is so famous throughout the world. So you are presented with the opportunity to play him, and it is an extraordinary physical change. Um, how do you begin? Well, first, I, I love the idea of being presented with the opportunity. I'm afraid it was not quite that um, ideal. It was it was a quite a, a did long. Did you have to fight? Yeah, for we it? did. Yeah, we did. Both Felicity and I, who's, who plays Jane, we had to fight quite hard for the parts. But um, who did they want? Not you. Well, I, I, I don't know that you never you never get to hear the actual list, but I know that there was one. Um, and but no, once once I got the part. It's, I sort of describe it as being like when you're trying to get a, a, a part in a film, it's a bit like any job interview. You're kind of, you do that thing of pretending in the job interview that you know exactly what you're talking about. You try and be as confident as you can. And you try to basically blag your way into getting a gig. And, and then the second you get it, you then have the crushing reality that you actually have to kind of try and do the thing or do the job. So, so I basically started by just educating myself on as much as I could about Stephen, his world, his, the subject matter, but also the disease. Again, th because this is so much a performance where your physical body takes up so much of the space on screen and yet we, are, we want to know about him emotionally. So it's the real challenge would seem to me to master the physical in a way that that was in front and center what we were seeing all the time. How did you break it down? Like, do you... Do you well, actually, no, there was one thing I had read that you actually kept a chart of how he developed his disease and how it degenerated. Actually, you know what? This would be a, a pretty good place to show this first clip because in the first clip, um, he and, and Jane are meeting and he can still sort of dance. <laughs> he doesn't want to, but he can sort of... Let's see this first clip and, and we'll, we'll know what I'm talking about. He walks, he talks. <laughs> So I do want to get back to that idea that you, you had to study the degeneration of the disease and you needed to be able to know where in the story you are in terms of how debilitated he was. Here, obviously, he is standing and chatting and talking, but this might have been shot after you had done another scene where he was much further along. Yeah, well, the first thing that has nothing to do with that, with that scene that always, always makes me laugh when I see it is that it involved UV light, and it's meant to be this very romantic moment. And I kept sort of warning the cinematographer. I was like, have you ever seen my face in UV light? Like, I, I have, like, a lot of freckles <laughs> and a load of skin damage, <laughs> and <laughs> it's meant to be incredibly romantic. And so he gradually had to sort of start working with different lights, I think, to make it look more... Um, no, but the physicality, I basically... I started going to an ALS clinic in London and I met, I worked with a specialist there and met maybe 30 or 40 people suffering from this pretty horrific, brutal disease um, and met their families as well. And so uh, I tried to educate myself on what the, the, the physical decline will have been. But with motor neuron disease or ALS as they call it here, you have what are called upper neurons and lower neurons. and 
when your upper neurons go, there's a kind of rigidity, and when the lower neurons go, there's a, there's a wilting. But ALS is a mixture of those two, and how it manifests itself in each person's suffering is entirely unique. So what was interesting was taking, basically, because there's no documentary material of Stephen before the 80s, it was about finding as many photos as we could of him and taking them to this specialist. And by, for example, there's a, a wedding photo where, where Stephen holds Jane's hand, but you can see that his hand's on top of hers and he's putting all his weight in and that his hand is, is wilted. So you can kind of guess that by that period, he had lower neuron in, in his hand. So it was about deciphering through that and then working, as you were saying, I worked through a sort of... Uh, a chart with each muscle and when it was going and and then I've worked with a dancer to try and find a way of, of putting that into my physicality. So with each muscle actually that you could you could know that you need to work on what your eyebrow is doing or what your foot is doing. Yeah I mean with the, with the facial side of it it was a lot about I, I hadn't I, Conveniently, I had an iPad. Production bought me an iPad, and it was um, and it was filled with every bit of um, every bit of footage that I could find, every single photograph of Stephen. And and when it came to the facial side of it, it was literally sitting in front of the mirror with an iPad and trying to recreate some of these. Um, because what's interesting is, as I'm, m many of you haven't haven't seen the film, but as the illness progresses, there's a certain stillness to Stephen because he can't use muscles, but but actually what's interesting performance wise is actually it's never you're never relaxing a lot of that you're controlling sort of things like blinking speed or how how quickly your eyes are moving um and so all of that was a really a work in progress but there were a lot of embarrassing moments when it was just me i had to make sure no one was watching by myself in front of a mirror with my trusty ipad and did you have a coach did you have a movement coach who would be there with you i i worked with an amazing my sort of instinct was that because we weren't shooting chronologically and we were going to be jumping into different... So in one day you would jump between playing him in his 40s to then playing in his 20s and, and then back again. It was really important for me that, that I really understood the physicalities, but that, they, but that the film wasn't a film about a disease or, or a physicality. So I kind of tried to learn it like a dance and I worked with a dancer to help me on that. Because this, you haven't... You, have, you were in Les Miserables, you were in My Week with Marilyn, you played a wonderful range of roles, but nothing quite this hard, physically hard. Did it hurt? It hurt. I've just noticed my Apple mug. <laughs> This is the greatest thing ever. <laughs> so amazing being here. I've come here for so many years and just come, it's like a museum, this place. Um, uh, yeah, just, I'd never played anything quite as hard, no. No. But, but at the same point, it was just the greatest privilege. You know, if, our, if our job is, is we want to tell stories, um, their story, the story of Jane and Stephen, is a pretty, well, pretty extraordinary one. And, and so it was a great privilege to, to get to meet and, and to play Stephen. But yeah, with it also came a wee bit of fear and responsibility. And, and did it hurt? I mean, what, how did you, the end of the day, you're finished, you get out of the wheelchair, what well, happens? Well, that's, that's why I worked with, with um, this dancer, Alex, for f four months beforehand, was kind of to train your muscles to be able to sort of um, to enclose and to, to sort of cramp without you getting spasms because when you're filming you have to sustain those positions for, for long periods of time and your body does get used to that but I also worked with a, a chiropractor, sort of osteopath for, for the months leading up to him and I became like a sort of a weird case study for him. He kind of he was like, "Oh, this is riveting. I'm going to write an essay on your spine." <laughs> it's like, um, but it, and and but then lots of baths and occasional emergency acupuncture was the way forward. Really, yeah. acupuncture. Yeah. But at the same point, it was it it was at moments uncomfortable, but you were always absolutely conscious of the fact that at the end of the day, you could get up out of the wheelchair and many of the people who I'd met who were were suffering from this disease couldn't. So you were constantly kind of reminded of how lucky I was. There's a, um, a very moving progression in the film where he gets his diagnosis for the first time and it's sinking in. He, you're, you, Hawking was given two years to live and in fact has lived 50 now since the diagnosis, right? But there's a, there's a moment when he, it, he has to take this all in and also Jane has to take this all in. Let's, let's take a look at this next clip.
Are you a, um, a Daniel Day-Lewis type who has to stay in character the whole time? You know, actually, quite <clears throat> quite a few people have asked that question. Yes, about I'm not of, original, well, no, just but about, it's no, <laughs> but about being method, and I don't, I, I, I don't, I don't entirely know what that term fully when, means. When when they said cut, do you still stay in in your character? character. I, I would try and stay within the physicalities because you would be there for, but, because they were always shifting. But I do love the idea. Some other people have also gone, well, you, you know, were you method on this? Have you, have you become brighter since doing it? I was like, I wish, I wish. I don't know how one would play Stephen Hawking being method because you've got to be able to solve the problems of the universe. Um, but no, I tried to stay in, in the physicalities, but there would be some days when I, I would, would jump in and out because it was, um, it was too uncomfortable, really. Mm. And, the, and then your co, co- co-stars are acting with you. Do they treat you differently would you say because you're in a chair well no I think by the time one of the things that was really important was when you meet people who are suffering from ALS the relationship with the the, the carer is, is is an extraordinary one because it's almost like they become a sort of extension of your body because you are unable to 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 move certain things it's and so there's a very intimate dance that happens and and so Felicity who's an old friend she and I had worked for several weeks at all the different stages of the film, trying to make sure that there was this kind of symbiosis between between the two of us, um, but no, no, people didn't didn't treat me like the genius. Maybe they should have done. Well, I didn't mean <laughs> I didn't mean a genius. I meant more. <laughs> I, I meant more somebody who was frail. Frail. Um, no, they didn't actually. I mean, it, they they really didn't. Um, I mean, there's a great relationship between you and David Thewlis as as your your mentor, your colleague, uh, the one who brought you along, and he seems to treat you as with the same jokes, except that you're in a chair. Yeah. Well, I think I think what, what, one of the things that really intrigued me was about how you you know, the respect that you have for the disease. And, and while we were learning about it, we were trying to be absolutely as, as, as respectful as possible. But it was when I met Stephen's family and his, his um, youngest boy, Tim, who's a wee bit older than me, a lovely man. And he, he, was, he was going, yeah, I know that the, he only knew his dad really in, that, in the physicality that we're used to seeing him in. But he was like, yeah, but I did used to get into dad's wheelchair and use it as a go-kart. Or like, or I would, I would type swear words into his voice machine and press play like, on repeat. And that was, that was so important because until then I was, you know, wanting to be absolutely respectful, but forgetting that there was this one gentleman I met who had ALS who, and the morning I met him, the night before he had gone to ER, having almost genuinely almost choked to death. And, and the morning that I met him, the following morning, his wife described how he had come down that morning and his first words had been, I wonder what death-defying act I can do today. It was his, you know, and, and this idea of always finding the positive when you're... In fact, just now I've come from a, a, a benefit raising money for Lou Gehrig's disease and, and just met some extraordinary people. And again, the humour and the wit, is, it's so... I'm a parent. And also, though, you're playing a guy who um, is bawdy and has a famous dirty sense and was a difficult fellow, is a difficult fellow anyhow, regardless of whether he has this disease or not. He can be somewhat of a pill. Well, uh, I'm very protective of my character. <laughs> Careful what you say. Uh, <laughs> them, them's fighting words. <laughs> no, uh, I, well, I think, I think it's a really complicated thing. Like Part of that is if you become entirely reliant physically on someone else, there is a massive burden of guilt. There has to be. Like, and, and how one chooses to cope with that, whether you, you're saying thank you for every single minute of, the, of every day for, that, that someone else has to fully look after you. I mean, I, I can't begin to imagine how complicated that is to negotiate, but for sure, like, Stephen has the most extraordinary confidence, as you would if you had a brain that phenomenal, but also he has a sense of mischief. Like, there's this kind of... When I met him, the, the overriding thing that I took away was not only this sort of humor, but this, this I describe it as like a lord of misrule quality. He, like, he absolutely, as you say, he has power, he controls a room, and, and there is a lot of power in, in the rhythm in which you communicate with him, in the sort of silences, which of course I try and fill with words and, and end up making a fool of myself. But. The, the idea of playing somebody, both for you and for Felicity, playing... People who are alive is a unique situation for an actor. Um, you, play, you play historical people, you play fictional people. 
Is that, is that, um, does that make you paranoid? <laughs> Terrifying. I wish there was an easy answer. It's like, it's genuinely... Because, because ultimately you know that they are going to see this film and they are going to be the, the, the ultimate in reviewers. And, and also there's a huge responsibility. I'm someone that's... All, I, you know, however much people go, yeah, but it's on film, it doesn't necessarily... Or, or you read it in a newspaper, it's not necessarily true. And yet I'm like a complete culprit of seeing something on film, a biopic on film, and going, that's obviously truth. And, and that's a great responsibility, like a lot of people... And again, though, because Hawking, we have seen footage of him. We know what he looks like. We know he's very much in our minds of what you can get a sense of the... the distress that his body is in well so no we felicity and i definitely felt that the, the weight of that but at the same point we were so taken in by jane and jonathan her second husband and stephen and his carers and their kids and or in that we were allowed to kind of enter their their orbit for a few months well and here whoa, 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 you're giving away a little bit which is not it's part it's part of the story you can you can look it up but the idea of the th the man who comes in jonathan t talk a little bit about the the other man do i have to do a spoiler alert <laughs> not if you've read wikipedia okay. you don't <laughs> um no so so one of the interesting things about this film certainly when i read it was that it wasn't you know it, it's an ex i think a, an incredibly unique quite complicated love story but it's not a it doesn't have a fairy tale ending um i sort of try and describe it as being a, a film with a sort of uplifting ending but not a hollywood ending um and and it, for me it really is an investigation into love in in all its guises so it, it deals with young love and passionate love but also the love of family and the love of of subject matter um, but also the complications and the boundaries of that. So there, is, there are other people in that Jane and Stephen are no longer married. Um, but, but I hope that there's a truth in, in, in the way that we, we um, played there. Because it, it, it is a lovely, it's a true story, but it's also a lovely Charlie... Charlie Cox. Charlie Cox, yeah. who plays Jonathan, yeah. who comes in and, and is, um, uh, teaches, uh, runs the church choir. Mm. And then starts helping becoming their friend and helper and then other relationships develop mm. it's 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 lovely the way that's eased in it's not done with um it's done in a subtle way and well, the, well they, they were kind people i mean they, what's interesting about these characters is that, that you you uh, what was important for charlie um felicity and i was not to judge the people, you know, it really is hopefully one of those films that it's a very unique set of circumstances. And at the end, you leave going, God, what would you do in that situation? How, you know, how thick is your skin? How strong is your determination? How, you know, it, it does, it really is about how this family had these obstacles put in front of them, but how they chose to overcome them or defy them. And a plus for, I mean, I hate uplift. <laughs> I love you know, uplift. I, I really, I hate uplift. I hate, so th th that this, this, this worked and there was uplift and, <laughs> and it worked. Um, one question I had, do you, can you still feel Stephen Hawking in your body? Well, I'm, not, I'm not, as, I'm not putting you on the spot like, oh, no. you know, doctor, look at my rash, but, no. but, uh, but, can, can no, you feel I mean, it? The answer is I, d I would never pretend for a moment that I, that I had, uh, had to, or, you know, uh, but, but, but what was interesting is there were physical ramifications. Like a lot of Stevens, he, he communicates a lot from the right side of his mouth. So the, the makeup designer, Jan Sewell, sort of started noticing that through the film that I got muscles that were stronger here and sort of wrinkles that were beginning. So I now have a more wrinkly right hand side of my face, apparently. Um, but, and, and I always find when I finish a finish playing someone in a film my family and people around me notice that there are little little traits but um no i like think your it, shoulder it's would been be... a it's been a well definitely that from the I, felicity and i hadn't realized it but from the word go from when we were cast our shoulders were a bit up like this and then over the look at you scrunched year, scrunched yeah. like that now. um um of course there's the whole other side which is the great mind of this character, what he's thinking, how he's examining the cosmos, how he's looking for the beginning of time and beginning and end and how it's all put together. Let's take a look at this clip, which looks at it in a different way. 
So, of course, you have read A Brief History of Time many times over. I, I have read I, all the words in A Brief History of Time have gone past my eyes. <laughs> whether, whether what I understood is an entirely different question, Lisa. <laughs> no, I, I did. I tried to read everything and... And, but online, I would go to these sort of complicated websites, and then I would go to literally astronomy for seven-year-olds, and and you know, I, I, dummy's I, I, guide. Literally the dummy's guide. There is that book. I may have bought it. Uh, and um, but no, eventually, I I started working with one of Stephen's old students, um, who in, who himself is a professor at Imperial College in London, and I remember he was going into the sort of intricate complexities of space time. Um, and I just had to say to him, please just imagine I'm seven. Like, go back to what, a, what genuinely what an atom is and let's start from the ground up. And, but it was an education, like an extraordinary education. And you've retained it all, yes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. You're going to ask me to explain it? <laughs> no. <laughs> go no, and no, see no, Interstellar. No. Apparently it because explains it really well. <laughs> we have time ticking right here. Um, I, eventually, I'm going to open this up to questions in a bit, but there's something that I want to ask you because this was just, um, you know, this appeared today also that you have an upcoming project in which you're going to play a transgender woman. That's true, yeah. Could you please talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I'm doing a film or just starting to embark on um, uh, the research for a film called The Danish Girl, which is a uh, film that Tom Hooper is directing, who directed um, he, Les Mis. He was your actor, yeah. he was your director in Les Mis. Yeah, and it's um, an extraordinary story about a couple who are artists in... Uh, Copenhagen in the 1920s, um, Gerda Weiner and Ina Weiner, and Ina was born um, gender male and became one of the first, if not the first, to transition. Um, and it's an extraordinary story about identity and about um, our time on this planet and, and being true to oneself. Basically. Because this wasn't hard enough and you just wanted well, something to follow. No, but it's a great... Pri again, similarly, it's a great privilege for me to, to play it or to play Lily. Um, I think it will be a challenge, but it's already... It's been an extraordinary experience preparing. So. Let's open this up to some questions. Hi, Eddie, how are you? Uh, was there something in particular uh, about the role of playing Stephen Hawking that made you really want the role? Yeah, it's a really good question. I, well, when I read it, I thought it was going to be a biopic. I thought it was going to be a biography as his life. Um, and, and then it completely subverted that after I'd read it. It, was, it. it really is the study of these two extraordinary people and how their lives, how they overcome the limitations that were put on them. And what I found amazing about it, although it's very specific to their story, I do feel like there's a, a sort of universal quality, without sounding too sorry, there's a universal thing that in our lives we all have people say no to us and put things in our way, but how one chooses to either break through those boundaries is, is pretty... It's pretty important, it's, and it is what defines us. So I found there's something really universal in it as well. Um, and then I just thought, it's Stephen Hawking. He's like a legend. Like, why not try? <laughs> it was only then when I got the job that I wanted to cry. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Eddie. Um, I was just wondering how you felt about people talking about your work on this project with regards to the Oscars. Well, hello, England. <laughs> 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 And I took such care not to mention the Oscars. Thank you for blowing all of that. Um, do you know, as I was saying before, when, when Felicity and I got cast, it was this extraordinary privilege, but it was also gigantic trepidation because it was like what ultimately we knew they were going to see it, the film, Jane, Jonathan, the children, and particularly Stephen. When they did go and see the film, and I saw Stephen just before he went to see it, and I said to him, I'm very nervous. And Stevens, you know, he's an extraordinary man, but he doesn't, he's also shrewd and strong. And, he, and when I'd met him beforehand, I was hoping he was going to go, I'm so thrilled you're doing this. Like, please <laughs> go ahead. Tell me. But that, that never happened. Um, and, and so I knew that he would only judge after having seen the film. And so, so when he did see the film and enjoyed it, and when Jane did, and the children, Lucy Hawking uh, wrote the most beautiful email to us, um, for me, that was the greatest, greatest reward. Now, I, I think their story is amazing. Any buzz, um, of course, it's lovely. I'm, I, I, I'm a bit scared of um, 
of buzz because it can all just sort of filter out. But of course, if it encourages you guys to go and see the film, then, um, then that's wonderful. So. Uh, given that the book is from Jane's point of view, and uh, you know, a large part of the film is that, I've luckily having seen it, um, it must have been a challenge to talk with her as the, you were working on the film. Or did you get a chance to speak with her much? And the last part of the question is, you must want to play a superhero as well now that you've done this kind of a character and hero. Uh, you know, what would you want to do? I mean, as an absolute contrast. Wow, is it? Um, the whole two, very, very do <laughs> two contrasting uh, questions. Uh, so Jane, it was absolutely the, the film is based on. For those who don't know, on Jane's book, and she's an extraordinary human being. And I remember again, we met her just before we started filming, and um, Felicity had gone to meet her. And I arrived. They both, Stephen and Jane, live in Cambridge, quite close by to each other. And I went into the house and found Felicity and Jane in Jane's closet, trying on her dresses, like her sort of trendy sort of. And um, and she was wonderful. And her book is, it, it was a bit of a, you know, I had to be careful because I was also very protective of, of Stephen's point of view. So I was reading all of his material and, and he had written an autobiography that came out around the same time as we started filming. But certainly her book in its intricacy and its detail was, was really important. Um, as far as playing a superhero, this character called Banana Man, <laughs> which you guys probably won't know very well, but in England, I like grew up watching on TV. Um, he eats bananas, a bit like Popeye. Um, recently, my friend Andrew Garfield, who plays Spider-Man, was asked in an interview if he could play another superhero, who would he play? And the, in the interview was like, would you ever consider Banana Man? And Andrew was like, no, 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 Ed's got dibs on that. So, so that's my, um, I'd be ferociously angry. If, but then I, I said, someone then looked him up the other day and he's like, he's like proper ripped. So I think, and he has like yellow hair and he wears a banana as a skin as a cape. So I think I've got my work cut out for me. Lisa referenced that it must be difficult or awkward or something that you're playing somebody who's still alive. Did Stephen Hawking ever come to the set? And what was that like if he did? Yeah, Stephen did come to the set. And uh, it was our second day of filming. And Get out of my chair. Uh, Jane, Jane had arrived, uh, had come on the first day. And she'd come running up to me. And, she, and I'd been playing Stephen Young. Um, and she'd come run, running up and she'd gone, no, 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 Ed, come on, his hair would be much messier than that. And she'd literally styled my hair to look like Stephen when he was young, which was an extraordinary thing. That's kind of what we dream of. But he, he, the second night was the big May Ball scene, where you, which you guys saw that first clip of. And, and there's a big fireworks display that happens in it. And um, fireworks are expensive. And so the producers had got three goes at the fireworks. So we had three takes on it. So everyone was a bit nervous anyway. And there was a bit of a sort of drum roll to it. And on cue, Stephen arrived, flanked by his nurses. And he has this computer screen which he uses to communicate, which kind of basically uplit him. It was like a spotlight on his face. And on cue, the fireworks went off. And it was like the greatest rock star entrance I have ever seen in my life. Uh, and, and he came. And, and Felicity was telling, reminding me the other day, there was a moment when we were doing this scene and out of the corner of our eyes, both of us could see the people that we were playing watching the monitors. And um, yeah, I think it was, it was pretty intense, yeah. Hi, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm your big fan since I saw my week with Marilyn. I heard you went to school with Prince William. Is he your friend? Then I heard you studied uh, history of art. How was it? Then can you use this for your movie making? By the way, Lisa, you, you're my favorite movie critic. Thank you. Thank you so much. You are like the best person hey, ever. Thank you so much. <laughs> Take it away. <laughs> um, I, I was at school with Prince William, yes, um, and he was a very lovely man, um, but I haven't seen him since I left school, which is about, uh, God, depressingly, about 12 years ago now. Um, uh, I also, yeah, he was a lovely man. Yeah, he was a... Was he my friend? Is yes, he your I would friend? count him as my friend, but I haven't seen him since. So, um, uh, what else? This, I studied history of art, yeah, which I loved, but it was very funny because I, it's weird to me that you can go to a university and get the same degree, but n really not do nearly as much work. And the art historians at Cambridge were always very, they were sort of placed quite near the engineers and the scientists. And, and you, we would go in, we would sort of, a lot of sort of bohemians would float in for sort of, you know, an hour or two a week to go and, yeah, let's go and look at some 
Let's go with some Marcel Duchamp. Why not? While these poor guys were in like, you know. Were you involved in theater even then? I did do actually. There was I, there are some amazing like Tom Hiddleston was there while I was there and um, Rebecca Hall and Dan Stevens um, from Downton Abbey. Um, and there, so there was a group of us who were all working there. Yeah. What was it like playing with Michelle Williams as Marilyn? Was there any moment where you got lost in the mystique of Marilyn because she's such a great, great icon in cinema and it was really done, it was a very sweet film, but I, there were moments when I actually felt like Michelle was Marilyn. I mean, I really got engaged with her character. How was it for you? Or did it really, she was always the actress and it was, there was no Marilyn because she's been gone for so long. And I, I, It was, thank you for being, I mean, Michelle did ex, it, it, extraordinary things in that film and um, there were so many qualities of that film like like Judy Dench was playing Dame Sybil Thorndike and Dame Sybil Thorndike's renowned for being the loveliest woman and no one would behave badly in front of her and similarly Judy is the loveliest woman in the world and similarly no one behaves badly when she's around because she's just so and and then it was a lot of English actors sort of in, in that film and and then Michelle was the American actress in it in the same way that the film they were making was all about English actors with the, the American. So there was a lot of sort of, and, and what was weird for me is I went to the school that the character went to. There was, um, and, and I will never forget, I was sort of whining about something one day and I think Michelle was like, Ed, you know, you're doing, you know, it's all good, but, it, but, uh, or I was saying, I, I don't know, I think she was having a tough day or something. I was going, God, it'll be fine. And she's like, when you're playing like, James Dean, then you can compare Jeremy you know I mean? like this. And so, I, so there was a, a, fu a funny moment when I started prep on this, and I was like, oh, now I see what she was talking about. The, 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 but what's interesting in, in relation to Marilyn is Stephen Hawking is a huge fan of Marilyn Monroe. And um, it, she, he always says if he could time travel, he would go back to meet her. And above his desk, he has a big photo of Marilyn. And then he has one for, he never met her, but he has a photo. He got, uh, there was a, a double, a Marilyn double. Um, and he has a photo above his desk, which is him in his wheelchair with this Marilyn double in the background. And we recreated that photo for the film. So if you haven't seen it yet, and it was basically my own little in-joke to myself, basically in relation to my week with Marilyn. So it's slightly pointless, but no, uh, Michelle was f formidable in it. And, um, and there were moments when you got lost completely. Um. I really want to give you this picture. Let me see. Um. Yes, please. I didn't know I got gifts. <laughs> oh. It's uplifting. <laughs> oh, amazing. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Who is it? Thank you so much. That is it. Absolutely genius picture. Thank you so much. Oh, no. Wowza. <laughs> this is the greatest thing ever. Thank you so much. Wow. I'm going to read this note. I'm not going to read it aloud in case there's anything personal in there, but thank you. Thank you so much. That's wonderful. And in turn, uh, thank you so much. I noticed, you know, I was sitting here and I said, well, the genius bar is over there, which just seems to make sense for sitting here and talking about Stephen Hawking. So it has been a great pleasure. Genius to genius to genius. Thank you very much to Eddie Redmayne. Thank you. Thank you guys for coming. <laughs>